Hello. In this video, we are going to derive the sigma and pi molecular orbitals of ethylene, C2H4. Our first step, as is usual, is to make a quick sketch of our molecule. And we have arranged the axes so that left and right is the x-axis, up and down is the y-axis, and the z-axis is normal to the whiteboard. That makes the plane of the whiteboard the xy plane. We will first derive the sigma molecular orbitals, and we notice that the group orbitals on hydrogen are all hydrogen 1s orbitals. So our first step is to label the group orbitals on hydrogen. We'll call this one S1, this one S2, S3, and S4. Next, we want to define a reducible representation for the sigma bonding. And recall that the character under each of the classes in the point group D2H, because the point group for ethylene is D2H, we want to write down the number of group orbitals that don't move under the operation. So under the identity, all four of the orbitals stay where they started, so our character there is four. For C2Z, this is the axis of this stick here, and that takes S1 to S3, S2 to S4, so we see that all of the orbitals move, so none stays put, so our character is going to be zero. Our axis, the C2 about the y-axis, flips S1 to S2 and flips S4 to S3, so again, zero orbitals stay put. For the x-axis, we have a C2 rotational axis along here, and that takes S4 to S1 and S3 to S2, so the character is zero. For the inversion, our center inversion is halfway between the carbon atoms, so that would take S1 to S3 and S2 to S4. Since all move, our character again is a zero. And then we have our three sigma v's, our vertical mirrors. The first one is the xy plane, and that reflects S1 into S1, S2 into S2, S3 into S3, and S4 into S4. Since all four orbitals stay in place, our character here is a 4. For sigma v x z, that is the plane coming this way, and that reflects s1 into s4, s2 into s3, so none of the orbitals stay in position. Last but not least of our vertical mirrors, we have the yz plane, which goes like this, so that reflects s1 to s2, s3 into s4, so our character here is a 0. Now we notice that our reducible representation has only two non-zero characters. That means we can expedite our reduction of the reducible representation into a linear combination of irreducible representations by only confining our attention to the E class and the sigma v x y class because all the other terms will end up being zero. The first irreducible representation that we're going to look for is A1G. And recall that the first step of the reduction formula is 1 over the order of the group. And the order of our group here is 8, since there are 8 symmetry operations in the group. And we can also expedite our solution here, since there's only one operation in each class. Previously, we had put a red number one to show that's position in the reduction formula. And now, since we've done a few of these, since the one is assumed, we'll just ignore the one. So the only non-zero terms we have in our reducible representation are for the E operation and for sigma V X, Y. So our first term, we have a four from the reducible representation. And our character from the irreducible representation, A1G, is a positive 1. So we have 4 times 1. Then for sigma V, the character from the reducible representation is a 4. And the character from the irreducible representation, A1G, is also a 1. 
So we have 4 plus 4 is 8. 1 divided by 8. 8 divided by 8 is equal to 1. So there is 1a1g in the reducible representation. Again, to expedite work, we notice that in any cases where the character for e is a positive one, but the character for sigma v xy is a negative one, we will end up getting terms like positive 4 and then negative 4, so this would end up turning out to be 0. So the only irreducible representations that are going to contribute to this reducible representation are those that have a plus 1 character for e and also a plus 1 character for sigma v. So we are only going to show those particular uh, irreducible representations. So let's see how many b1g's we have. So recall, the 4 comes from the reducible representation. And then the character for the irreducible representation, b1g, is a 1 for e. And in fact, for every single irreducible representation in D2H, because there is no degeneracy, the character for every single irreducible representation for e will be a 1. Then we look at the sigma v x y operation. And then the character there is a positive 4. The character from the irreducible representation b1g is a positive 1. So again, we have 1 b1g included in our reducible representation. And let's look at b2u, 1 eighth. And the character from the reducible representation will always be the same. For e, it will be a 4 here. The character from the irreducible representation, b2u, is a positive 1. Then for the sigma v x y, that's the only other class we need to look at because it's the only other non-zero character, the character is a 4. And then the character from the irreducible representation, b2u, is a positive 1. So that tells us there is 1 b2u in the reducible representation. And the last non-zero contributor to the reducible representation is B3U. So the character from the reducible representation is A4. The character from the irreducible representation up here for B3U is a positive one. So now we need to look at sigma VXY. The character from the reducible representation is a positive 4. The character from the irreducible representation, B3U, is a positive 1. So that gives us 1. In other words, that means that our reducible representation can be written as a linear combination A1G plus B1G plus B2U plus B3U. Next, we apply the projection operator method, and we look at the effect of each symmetry operation on a representative orbital, in this case we'll take S1, and see what happens to S1 under each of the symmetry operations of the group. Under the identity, S1 stays S1. C2Z is the axis coming out of the board, so that takes S1 to S3. For C2 around the y-axis, which is this axis, it takes S1 to S2. Around the C2 around the x-axis, takes S1 to S4. The identity, uh, the uh, inversion, I apologize, uh, goes through this point, so it takes S1 to S3. Sigma V XY is the plane of the board, so that just takes S1 into itself. For sigma v x z, that's this particular plane, so that takes s1 to s4. And our last mirror plane, y z, is this particular mirror plane, so that takes s1 to s2. Now we continue to fill in our table with the characters from the character table for d2h 
for each particular irreducible representation that formed part of the uh, gamma sigma for ethylene. So recall A1G is a totally symmetric representation. So right away, we know that all the characters are going to be a positive one. The second irreducible representation is B1G. And B1G's characters are a plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. Then for the next two, we have plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. We next have B2U. And its characters are one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Then minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. And the last irreducible representation is B3U. And its characters are one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. So having everything in the same table will make our next manipulations that much easier. To see what the A1G molecular orbital looks like, we multiply each character in the row for A1G times the appropriate term above it in the table. So 1 times S1 plus 1 times S3 plus 1 times S2 plus 1 times S4. If we continue this, we get S1 plus S3 plus S2 plus S4 plus S3 plus S1 plus S4 plus S2. And you realize that we can combine this as 2S1 plus 2S2 plus 2S3 plus 2S4. And uh, if we were going to apply normalization to that, if you know how to do that, we would just normalize it. But we can also see that we can divide through by a factor of 2, and get the lowest terms, we have S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. So this is the first of the group molecular orbitals on ethylene that has the A1G symmetry, S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. Next, we look at the B1G molecular orbital. And again, we do the same procedure as before. We multiply each character times the term in the same column. So 1 times S1 plus 1 times S3 minus S2 minus S4. So S1 plus S3 minus S2 plus S4. So S1 minus S2 minus S3. And then we have plus S3 plus S1 minus S4, minus S2. And like A1G, we can simplify this down as 2S1 minus 2S2 plus 2S3 minus 2S4, which can be reduced to lowest terms as S1 minus S2 plus S3 minus S4. Now for the B2U combination. We multiply the character in the row times the term above it in the same column. So 1 times S1 is S1. Minus 1 times S3 is minus S3. 1, so plus S2. Minus 1 times S4 is minus S4. Minus S3 plus S1 minus S4 plus S2. So we get 2S1 plus 2S2 minus 2S3 minus 2S4, which again, we can reduce to lowest terms, um, ignoring normalization for the time being, as S1 plus S2 minus S3 minus S4. And this is the B2U molecular orbital combination. Last but not least, we have the B 
3u combination. We multiply each of the characters times the appropriate term in the same column. So 1 times s1 is s1. Minus 1 times s3 is minus s3. Minus 1 times s2 is minus s2. Plus 1 times s4. Minus 1 times s3 is minus s3. Plus s1. Plus s4. Minus 1 times s2 is minus s2. So again we get 2s1 minus 2s2 minus 2s3 plus 2s4 and we can divide through by 2 to get in lowest terms s1 minus s2 minus s3 plus s4. Our next step is to visualize what these group orbital combinations actually look like. So our first example is our A1G. Recall that our formula for that was S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. Since all of the orbitals have a plus one coefficient, that tells us they all have the same phase, so we can sketch it as simply as just the 1s orbitals on all the hydrogens having exactly the same phase so that they are all open circles. Our next combination is B1G, and B1G was S1 minus S2 plus S3 minus S4. So since S1 and S3 have positive coefficients, it tells us they have the same phase as each other, whereas S2 and S4 have a minus one coefficient, so that tells us they have the opposite phase. So first we draw our S1 and S3 with the same phase as each other as an open circle, and then S2 and S4 have the opposite phase, and we draw that as the filled in circle. So we see two of the 1s hydrogen orbitals have positive phase, and two of them have negative phase in B1g. Next we have B2u, and the formula for B2u was S1 plus S2 minus S3 minus S4. So here S1 and S2 have the same phase, S3 and S4 have the opposite phase. So we can sketch that as S1 and S2 being open circles, S3 and S4 being closed circles because they have the opposite phase. Then the final combination is B3U, and that is S1 minus S2 minus S3 plus S4. So now S1 and S4 have the same phase, and S2 and S3 are the opposite phase. So we do S1 and S4 first as open circles, and then S2 and S3 as filled in circles because they have same phase as each other, but a different phase from S1 and S3. So here are the four group orbital linear combinations that form molecular orbitals. Our next step is to see which atomic orbitals on the two carbon atoms have the proper symmetry to interact with these molecular orbitals to form first sigma bonds, and then we'll see any combinations of the carbon atomic orbitals which can form pi bonds. For the A1G combination, there are two different combinations of atomic orbitals on carbon which have the proper symmetry, so we'll leave A1G to the end. First we'll look at now B1G. So we need the atomic orbitals on carbon, the two carbon atoms, that have the proper symmetry to interact with this combination of group orbitals. And the combination that will work is if we have P orbitals on carbon, so first we want to have it so that these have the same phase and these have the same phase. So this is, as far as carbon is concerned, the carbon-hydrogen bond is bonding. But then on the other side, we have a p orbital on carbon that has to be positive phase at the top and negative phase at the bottom. So these are the py orbitals on carbon, and we notice that with regard to the 
hydrogen atoms, the carbon-hydrogen bonds are all bonding, but between the two carbons, we have an antibonding orbital. So we actually have a node that goes through the molecular orbital right there for B2U. For B1G, apologies, that's B1G. For B2U, we now need to find the appropriate atomic orbitals on carbon. And we see, look very similar. Again, we're going to have PY orbitals on carbon, but now we're going to have them such that both of the P orbitals are net bonding. Uh, with regard to carbon carbon is bonding. And we have, as far as this carbon and the hydrogens, it's all bonding because this has the same phase, this has the same phase. But the hydrogens with respect to each other are antibonding in this direction. So we have a node in the molecular orbital that goes in this particular direction for B2U. Now for B3U, we don't have a combination of P orbitals on carbon that will have the right symmetry, but we notice that if we use the 2S orbitals, such that the two orbitals are antibonding with respect to each other, but bonding with respect to, from carbon to hydrogen, so these all have the same phase, so they're bonding. These have the same phase, so they're bonding. But we go from negative phase to positive phase, since the wave function is continuous, if it goes from positive to negative or negative to positive, it must have gone through zero, which is a node. So we have a node in this direction for the B3U uh, molecular orbital. Now for A1G, we actually have two different combinations of atomic orbitals on carbon that have both the right symmetry and the right energy to interact with the hydrogen group orbitals. So the first of these is the 2s orbitals on carbon. So they have the proper symmetry, they're bind bonding compared to each other, and they're bonding with respect to the hydrogen atoms. So this is the combination of the 2s orbitals on carbon to form a1G. The second A1G combination, which is higher in energy for reasons which we'll see in a second, again we have all four of the hydrogen atoms have exactly the same phase, and but now we have them bond with p orbitals in the x direction on the carbons. So here we have net bonding effect because they all have positive phase. Here we have net bonding because we have positive phase. And then here we have negative phase with negative phase. So this is net bonding for the carbon-carbon bond as well. But since the 2p orbitals on carbon, the 2px orbitals, are higher in energy than the 2s orbitals on carbon, this molecular orbital is higher in energy than this molecular orbital, even though they are both a1G symmetry. You may have noticed that we've already used the 2S carbon orbitals. We've used the 2PX on carbons and the 2PYs, but we haven't used the 2PZs yet. And the 2PZs are actually form the pi bonding combination. So recall that Z is coming perpendicular to the plane of the board. So if we have the following combination on the carbons. So we have the PZ orbitals arranged in the following orientation. So the same phase along the bottom, same phase along the top. So we have a pi binding orbital, PZ. This will be the lowest energy combination. And then the other combination having the same PZ orbitals on carbon, if we have them arranged in this orientation, we have the higher energy pi antibonding orbitals on ethylene. Now what's incredibly interesting about ethylene as our simplest alkene is that this pi bonding orbital on ethylene is the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied orbital is the pi antibonding. So a typical feature of many alkenes is that the pi system 
is right at the frontier. It's right at the, the edge of the occupancy of electrons with the highest occupied orbitals and the lowest unoccupied orbitals. And transitions from this state to that state are incredibly important, not only in this alkene, but in many, many organic molecules. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.